It's been a month since I started researching for this video and I built 7 to 8 different streaming apps with various Google Auth methods. But after testing all of the solutions, none felt truly satisfying. Data fans, I find it hard to recommend a one-size-fits-all solution that doesn't involve digging into the authentication workflow, so instead let me walk you through the solutions I tried so you understand the Google authentication workflow and can confidently work with those libraries yourself. But before trying any Google sign-in technique, we need to create the keys to access the Google Kingdom in a dedicated Google Cloud project. Head to the credentials page under APIs and services. To access user data like the name, Gmail, profile picture, and Google resources like calendar meetings, you first need to configure the consent window to access the resources. Find the OAuth consent screen. Edit your app's metadata, the name, website, developer email, and logo. On the next page, click Add Scopes and select the resources you want the app to access. It would be the Open ID, User Info Email, and Profile Scopes. And if you enable the Calendar API beforehand, you can also scroll to select the Google Calendar Events Read Only Scope. Scopes are categorized by sensitivity. It doesn't matter for local testing, but if you release your app to the world, it needs to go through a Google verification process first which will be more difficult depending on how many sensitive scopes you are asking for. While you are in testing mode, you can add friends and family Google emails as beta testers to log into your app. Next, create a new OAuth client ID credential for a web application. The Google authorization server needs a path back to your Streamlit app to send back a code. For now, provide HTTP localhost 9000 as a callback address. We will think later about how to listen to it. A new client ID and secret will be created. Copy those into .streamlit slash secrets tunnel file, then download the JSON secret file to the root of your project. It will act as our passport to the Google gates. We are ready to authenticate. Four weeks ago, I looked for Python authentication libraries and I found options like request OAuth or offlib for building OAuth 2 slash OpenID Connect clients. At this point, I kept reading those two terms everywhere. We just set OAuth to keys with OpenID scopes. Platforms like GitHub, Twitter, and Google provide OAuth to endpoints to let Python apps securely access user data. Tools like Solara and Panel simplify OAuth to configuration for their developers. It's like if your Python web app has to access user info from a website without manipulating passwords, you should look into OAuth 2 slash OIDC documentation. I pip installed the Google Auth OAuth library. It includes the get user credentials method, taking as input the client ID, client secret, and a subset of access scopes we defined in the consent screen earlier. You can also indicate a minimum and maximum port. For demo purposes, I limit it to port 9000. I trust you remember where we configured localhost 9000. When I click the login button, Streamlit calls get user credentials and opens a new browser tab for me. There's the authorization URL it opened for me. Data fans, we are not on my Streamlit app anymore. We are interacting with Google's authorization server. If I'm not signed in with a Google account, it displays a new Google sign-in window. Let me enter my Gmail credentials. I am the only test user that can authenticate with this client ID anyway. I added myself as the only beta tester while this app is not verified. Then on the next window, the Google authorization server asks me, the user, to confirm the app can access the resources from the subset of scopes like my name or my Google calendar. Oh yes, I, I accept. Authentication flow successful and I receive a credentials object back in Python without ever handling Google passwords in my code. I am not a hacker who tries to steal your Google passwords. The credential contains a few interesting objects, but right now I only need user information provided by the OpenID Connect scope. So I extract the ID token from the credentials. There is a procedure to decode and verify the authenticity of the token just in case someone corrupted it with a scam email. 
And now I have access to my user's name, my verified Gmail address, and a URL to my profile picture, which are pretty easy to display in my StreamIt app and store in a database for future usage. Since the Google Calendar read scope is included in the flow, I can even use the access token in the credentials as an ID card to read the user's Google Calendar. This is the easiest solution to authenticate with Google and access your Google resources from Streamlit. Unfortunately, it won't work on Streamlit Cloud. The process looks a bit opaque at first, but under the hood, Get User Credential runs a local Flask server that listens on localhost 9000. However, the Docker image for Streamlit Cloud has three limitations. First, I cannot spawn new processors to mine Bitcoin. I mean, I cannot spawn a new Flask server that listens to port 9000. Second, the remote Streamlit app cannot access my local browser to open a new tab. And third, the port 9000 isn't exposed by the container. If you really need this solution, you're better off deploying your own Docker image in another cloud service. Can't I just use Streamlit's Tornado server instead? Unfortunately, as of this video's release, there is no native way to get the Tornado instance and tell it to listen to another endpoint. So maybe I should just spin, you know, my own Python server to listen to port 9000, right? So I installed FastAPI. <laughs> Why FastAPI instead of Flask? No reason, just because. No reason. <laughs> FastAPI opens on port 8000 by default. I could have changed the command line to run on port 9000, but instead I added localhost 8000 slash auth slash code as a new callback URL for my OAuth client. I don't think it's a good practice to stuff many up callbacks in a OAuth client. It could crumble under so many responsibilities. Anyway, I define a new get slash out slash code endpoint in FastAPI and run the app next to Streamlit to catch any callback to localhost 8000 slash out slash code. Back to my Streamlit app, I create a new OAuth flow to generate a Google authorization URL and states. It is a randomly generated ID that is baked into the authorization URL and sent to Google's authorization server. I kind of consider this as the ID of the current authentication flow and I expect the authorization server to keep it in mind. Then I embed the authorization URL into a link button which redirects the user to Google's auth servers on a click. So far we're in known territory. As always I input my Gmail account, consent to let it use my profile info, press OK, then instead of the authentication is a success text. I'm getting back the hello world from FastAPI. So after the logging and consent screen, the Google authorization server sends back a response to the callback URL, which FastAPI catches. You now might as well play with this callback. I add a state and code argument to FastAPI, so it parses them out of the request, and then I just display them in an HTML response. And look at this, the state and code gets passed into my HTML. Nice. Let's try a new authentication flow in Streamlit and see if FastAPI catch the authorization callback. You can use this code to get your credentials from the Google resource server. But be quick, agent fan, this code will self-destruct in five minutes. I create a new form in Streamlit to copy-paste the state and code back from FastAPI. If the state ID from the origin Streamlit and the Google authorization server callback to FastAPI match, I know they come from the same flow. So this temporary authorization code is for me, and I can use it to ping the Google resource server for user credentials using the fetch token method. And then like last time, I extract and verify the ID token from the credentials to get the logged in user, yada yada. Yep, that's the full OAuth to workflow breakdown behind get user credentials. This is the most common authentication flow on the web. It's called the web application flow or authorization code grant type flow. It's the default flow in any Python OAuth web library. 
But I I still have a few questions. For for example, what do I do with those credentials after reading user info from the ID token? Should I like store the credentials somewhere so I can reload them when the user comes back to the session? And, and if a hacker steals the access token, can they read my Google Calendar for secret meetings with my manager? To answer those questions, I pushed my MVP a little further. Maybe too much, so I won't show the full code, but the project is in the description below. I added a slash session endpoint in FastAPI that creates a new authorization URL and state ID. I store this state in a local SQLite or a remote Firestore database. Streamlit calls this to create a session on FastAPI and in the database and get the authorization URL. With a button click and a redirect hack, I push the user to the Google authorization URL for login and consent. The Google Auth server calls back FastAPI, which parses the callback URL for the state and authorization code. And if the state ID is in the database, it uses the code to fetch the access and ID tokens from the resource server. Finally, FastAPI sends a redirect response back to Streamlit and stores the state ID in an HTTP-only secure cookie on my browser. Cookies. Well, since Streamlit 1.37, Streamlit can read cookies with the stContextCookies method. So on each return to Streamlit, I can read the state from the cookie, send it to FastAPI to check if there's a matching session, and if one exists, reuse the tokens from the session in the database to get back calendar and profile information. That way, sensitive tokens are never sent to the client browser. I later discovered that this is called session-based authentication. It's fun to implement once in your life, but uh, it just opens a new batch of troubles if backend development is not your specialty. For example, because this access token has so much power in accessing user resources, it has a very short lifespan in case it gets stolen. At least we are lucky since those tokens stay on the backend tornado server side in Streamlit. We don't display them in any frontend code. And actually, because of the short lifespan of an access token, there is a third token in the credentials objects that I didn't talk about. It's called the refresh token. In case the access token expires, I should use the refresh token to renew the access token instead of going through a new login flow. Speaking of login flows and cookies, you know, GDPR, privacy, don't track people. Putting a cookie is considered browser tracking. And if I deploy my app to the world, I am supposed to ask for consent to store the cookie on the user's browser. And I'm sure I will forget to do it. <laughs> yep, anyway, as a data expert, that's a lot of tokens, sessions, and cookies to deal with. This video is sponsored by myself. <laughs> if you want to support me researching, editing, and showcasing the latest data and web practices for data fans, consider buying me a coffee to stay awake or offer a super thanks after I show you the next authentication technique that doesn't require FastAPI. Let's go. If we have a hard time doing back and forth server-side interaction in Streamlit, why not do everything on the front-end side? That's when it appeared to me. The ultimate Google widget. I found a Google sign-in button that could be embedded in HTML JavaScript code. Elegant fact, by using a Streamlit component, I can embed the HTML Google sign-in button in my web app, catch the Google token in the JavaScript callback, and push the token back into server-side Tornado Python code. Then finally, I use Google Auth, OAuth, Slip, whatever, verify token to extract the token ID. It works! As long as I add the Streamlit localhost 8501 URL to the list of authorized origins in my OAuth credentials on the Google console. No FastAPI server needed, no back and forth between the authorization and the resource, no storing and comparing session tokens, Google does all of the hard stuff for you. Actually, if you look into your local cookies, 
you will find out a new SIDCC cookie from a Google origin. SIDCC for Session ID Secure HTTP only cross site cookie. If you're interested, I'm using this component template from Tiago, one of the Schmidt founders, and you can find the source code in the description below. Again, okay, does it work on Streamit Cloud? Well, the logging and console screen don't load. Let's see if I check the Web Dev Tools console, it tells me the given origin is not allowed for the given client ID. Let me add the URL to the list of JavaScript origins and wait a few minutes again. Okay, uh, let's try again. Yep. We've seen three different techniques to do Google authentication that work well in low stakes environments. I personally use the get user credentials locally or on an on-premise server for quick login. For example, for my YouTube analytics dashboard. It sounds like the sign in button component is a better beginner friendly solution, especially if you have access to the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, which is not really the case in Streamlit and I know I'm too lazy to maintain JavaScript logic in the long run, so I tend to stick with Python-based server-side solutions. For more flexibility or fine-tuning, deploying your own FastAPI server to catch the authentication flow is a nice setup, as long as you put HTTPS everywhere. There are two more solutions that didn't make it in this video because it's already too long, but do tell me in the comments if you want a second one. The first one is the authentication as a service path. You can use OAuth providers like Auth0, Firebase Authentication, or Superbase to manage a unique single sign-on with multiple identity providers, user data, and session cookie management for you. They even have their dedicated UI. For example, here Solara OAuth method redirecting to an Auth0 logging, and Streamit Cloud redirects you to AuthKit's UI. A second ID commonly used in production settings, it's even recommended as a best practice in the Unicorn documentation for deploying Flask, is to put your Streamit app behind a reverse proxy like Nginx or Caddy. The reverse proxy handles load balancing, caches static files, and most importantly, manages OAuth authentication via solutions like Authentic, Otelia, or Keycloak. It then redirects the logged in user to the Streamit app via HTTP header to identify them. Just like cookies, starting version 1.37, Streamlit can access headers through the stContextHeaders method to access user information passed by the reverse proxy. So we're good. Nope. <laughs> now I'm off to play with Caddy as a reverse proxy for Streamlit. And if it goes well, maybe I should plan a video about hosting Streamlit apps in pseudo production settings with Caddy. So, you know, I'll see you around. Bye.